Well, hello there. Welcome back to another session of Virtual Field Trips, Travels, and Destinations. My name is Beth Gaff, and I'm the Systems Manager here at the Peabody Public Library. Today, we are going to be visiting a few different pottery studios. This is very, very exciting from beginning to end of how we get those vases and those bowls and those pots that we have out there and uh, how we make them, uh, all of the behind the scenes of this. Um, and just like all of our other virtual field trips, there will be some lesson plans and activities that you could do uh, in affiliation to our pottery, pottery studio uh, virtual field trip today. So um, there are some items out there that can be purchased, pottery wheels and all the tools and essentials to get you going, as well as clay uh, to do some very simple pottery studio style um, pieces. So all I did was go on my Google search and I typed in pottery studio and I got a lot of different hits and websites that we're gonna take a look at uh, to show you different kinds of pottery studios uh, throughout the United States and even perhaps in other countries. This goes back way, way, way. So uh, this is a really exciting class today. There's a lot of history to be known and learned uh, as far as pottery and pottery studios go, where they came from and how they have evolved over the years. Uh, so when this starts here, uh, I do have a couple of videos to show you in regards to visiting a uh, pottery studio. And then we're going to go into some different links uh, that you could go out on a whim and uh, take a look at their facilities or possibly connect with them. Again, there are so many out there in the United States and farther that uh, we're only going to briefly touch the surface of this so it can go a lot farther. Uh, but I don't want to waste any more time because I'm really excited. Art is kind of my thing. So I really want to get started on our Pottery Studio uh, virtual field trip today. So without further ado, let's take a look at Pottery Studios. <laughs> Vision. We're here today to find out about pottery. All right, my name is Kaylin. Welcome to Joe Picasso's. Here we do pottery painting, we play with clay, we do mosaics, and we have a lot of fun getting very creative with a lot of artwork. Are you guys ready? Yes! All right, so follow me. Let me show you guys around. Okay. You can look up here. We have samples that are already painted, and we have things that are unpainted. We have things that are plates and bowls and cups that you can use. And then we have things that are just fun and fun to look at. So look around and let us know what you see. With big eyes. This is creepy. That's a big face. That's not creepy. Look at the piggy bank. Ooh, piggy. We'd like to encourage you to think outside the box. See how he's a piggy, piggy bank, but he's painted like a watermelon. So you don't have to paint something pink just because it's a pig. You can paint it however you want. Here at Joe Picasso's, we don't just do the pottery painting. We also have mosaics where you can make beautiful pieces of art using bits and pieces of glass and ceramic. And it's just something new and different to offer. Oh, it's beautiful. Great, thanks for showing us. Yes, you're welcome. All right, so now we're gonna head over to the wheel and we're gonna meet Kevin and we're gonna see how you throw clay on the potter's wheels. Hello, how are you all today? Good. My name's Kevin, I'm gonna be showing you about throwing on the wheel today. How do you throw the clay on? Well, that's a good question. What I do is I take a piece of clay that's been balled up and all the air has been pressed, pressed out of it, and I actually throw it straight down onto the, onto the bat here. That's, this is called the bat. How do you make the wheel spin? What I use today is an electric motor, and I have a little pedal over here that allows me to control how fast it's moving. So I can go fast, or I can go really slowly. How do you mold the clay? All right, so first I get my hands wet so it doesn't stick to them. And then I start by opening up the center of the clay, like that. And you see how that opens up? Just by me pushing down, I have to keep my hands wet. And then, using my hands, I push the clay in towards it. And see how it goes taller now? Yeah. See how it's starting to turn into something? Because I can also take the clay and open it up into a bowl. Ooh, wow. Ooh, that's cool. Can you make the 
this same piece tall. All you can do is just push in like that, and it starts to get taller and more like a cup. Oh, well, thank you very much for showing us the wheel. You're <laughs> welcome. I'd shake, but... We'll pretend. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye. All right, so today I'm gonna to show you guys how to make a pinch pot using clay, okay? Um, We're gonna start with a ball of clay, and I'm just gonna put it on the table, and I'm gonna use my thumb and push all the way down to the bottom. So you're gonna use lots and lots of arm strength, and you're gonna push and make a hole in the bottom of your pot. Okay, once you've put your thumb down in the bottom of your pot, you're going to pinch around the clay. That's why they call it a pinch pot, because you're gonna squeeze, and then turn it, and squeeze, and turn it, and squeeze, and you just keep doing that. So, do you guys see these cracks here? Yes. That doesn't look very pretty, so what I'm gonna do to get rid of that is I can either just use my hands, which is always fun in art, and you're just gonna use some water, and you can kinda use your fingers to smooth that out, or we've got the sponges, and you get a little bit of water. Now make sure to squeeze out all the water. You don't want a lot of water. And then you can just use that. I wanna put a little ladybug right at the bottom of my bowl, so I'm gonna take my little stamp, and I'm gonna add some texture to my piece by sticking my little stamp in there, and then I pull it out, oh, and I've got a little ladybug in there. Okay, you want to try it? You guys you ready to get started? Yes. Yes. With your own? Yes. yes, all right. All right, guys, let's carry these over to the table. Are we ready to paint our clay? Yeah. All right. When you guys are painting, I want you to think about what colors you want to use before you start to paint. So if it's a gift for somebody and you know that maybe they like blue, it'd be a nice thing to paint something that they that's their favorite color. I want you to put nice, see how thick that's going on there? You want to dip your paintbrush and paint a lot. So you want it nice and gloppy because this isn't like regular paint. This isn't stuff that they have in most schools. This is a special kind of paint. It's actually called glaze. And glaze is crushed glass. And so they make it into liquid glass, so then you're gonna paint it on here. See how thick that's going on there? Nice and blobby. Okay, grab a paintbrush. And Emily, what are you thinking about for painting yours? That I'll give something to my sister, and then I'll give something to my mom, and I'll very use cool. colors that they both love. So. That's very cool. I think I'm gonna paint yes. mine yellow so that it's bright like the sun. Very nice. Welcome to the kiln room. This is where all the magic happens. This right here is a kiln. It's K-I-L-N, like Nancy. Everybody always says kiln. So this is the kiln. This is the brains of the kiln. This is the part that makes all the decisions. This is what decides how hot it gets for how long and what everything happens. And then do you see these little things right here, these little coils? Those are what heat up. It's just like your oven at home, but it gets a lot, lot hotter because your oven at home goes to like, what, 500 degrees? This puppy can get up to almost 5,000 degrees. The pieces that we're gonna put in here, they go up to about 1,800 degrees. The clay pieces are gonna cook and the glaze on there is gonna cook and it's gonna come out nice and smooth and shiny. So, if you guys look over here, you can see these pieces on these two shelves. These are our pieces. So we're just gonna take them from there and put them straight into the kiln. So, what I want you guys to do is if I can have two of you kind of come closer to me, you can kind of look inside here. <laughs> Yeah, there's not a ton of room over here. So we put shelves in here, and you can see that there's pieces already in there ready to go. They're hiding in there, so we stack everything. So those are posts. These things right here are posts, and then we put all the stuff in there, we put a shelf on top of the posts, and we stack and stack and stack. So there can be hundreds of pieces in a kiln all at the same time. And I wanna show you guys the stilts. See this basket over here with all these goodies on there? Oops. These are, don't touch these, because these are very sharp. So these are like little needles or little nails. These are called stilts. These are pads full of all those little needles. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take your clay pieces and we're gonna put them on top of these little pads. So this little bed of needles, your piece sits on there, and then once it comes out of the kiln, because these are so tiny, they're barely touching your piece, your piece will pop right off of there. Try not to move any of the glaze. And then we take it in here. Ooh, we're that's nice. It is, and we're gonna need maybe two minutes. 
Yes. All right, so now that our pieces are in the kiln, I'm gonna close this lid right here. Go in there. And then I'm gonna turn the machine on and they have to spend 24 hours in here. So I'm gonna say goodbye to you guys and I will see you later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Let's visit the home studio of Audrey Deal McEver, a potter who is going to share with us how she throws a pot, carves into it, glazes, and fires it from start to finish. Let's go. Hi, my name is Audrey Deal McEver, and I'm a potter. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, and I've been working with clay for about, I guess, going on 12 or 13 years now. I first got started in clay in college which I started off studying photography in college, and I do photography as well. Um, but it's kind of a funny story the way I ended up in ceramics because the first clay class I took, I actually didn't like at all. Um, my teacher and I didn't get along that well. He was one of those very stern guys who just didn't have much to say in terms of how hard I was working or how successful my work was. And quite frankly, my work wasn't all that good, so I don't blame him, but he didn't have anything positive to say. And um, he really frustrated me. And this thing happened where I, I got so determined to prove to him that I could do this, despite the fact I wasn't any good, that I started working really, really hard. And about halfway through the semester, he pulled me aside on a Friday night. It was probably about 10 p.m. And all my friends were out doing fun things, and I was there working in the studio. And he said, Audrey, do you actually like this, or are you just this studious? And I had to think, well, I don't know. <laughs> and I started to realize I do like this. And I changed my major to study ceramics too. And I've been working clay ever since. So this is my home studio. And I'm going to show you how to throw a vase. First step in preparing clay is to wedge it. And basically, this is like mixing or kneading bread dough. But it does two things. First thing it does is get all the air bubbles out of it. And then the second thing it does is it helps align the clay particles. Clay is made up of these little shingles that kind of look like the shingles on your house. And they're floating back and forth on water. And clay works best when you get all those shingles aligned. So as I'm mixing this, you can see it's starting to spiral around. And that's helping align those particles. But the way you can check yourself to see how well it's mixed is by cutting in half with a wire tool. And that's what you want to see. There shouldn't be any little holes in it. A hole would tell me that I have air pockets. Air pockets make it very difficult to use the clay when it's on the potter's wheel. So I am going to throw a vase on the potter's wheel. And so far my setup here, I have my splash pans, which are going to catch all the goo that flies off the wheel. I have my bat. A bat is just a plate that you throw your pot on top of. And the nice thing about the bat is you can lift it up and move it without touching your wet gooey pot, which makes things easier, especially when you're working big. Then I have some clay tools. This is a needle tool. I have a wooden knife that I'll use to trim the bottom corner. And then I have all these different rib tools. And it's a funny name. In England, they call them rubber kidneys, which I think is quite good. Uh, but these are used for shaping the clay. So the idea here is that you can bend these and flex them into different stencils and then push the clay out into that shape. So you'll see me use that after I throw the basic cylinder and I want to push it out into some curves. And then, most important of all, I have a bucket with a little bit of water and a sponge. Because it's almost impossible to throw a pot when clay gets really sticky and dry. I already made a, 
kind of ball shape of clay and I'm slapping it down on the wheel to make sure it really sticks. It takes a good bit of force there. And what you're not seeing is a pedal I have down here. I guess I can hold it up, but um, this is an electric wheel, which means it has a pedal kind of like a car that makes it spin faster as you push it and it stops when you push the back. But there are wheels that don't require electricity too, called kick wheels. I just don't happen to have one of those. So before I can actually start making my vase, I have to do what's called centering. And centering is what makes all the clay smooth and completely in the center of the wheel so that I can manipulate it without getting wiggles and bumps that would throw off the shape. So I'm pushing forward with my left hand, I'm pushing down with my right hand, and this is feeling pretty good. It's not wiggling the way it was when I first put it on the wheel. Let me push on one more time just to be sure. That feels pretty good. And since I'm throwing a shape that's going to be tall and narrow, I'm centering into a kind of tall and more narrow shape too. If I was throwing a plate or a bowl, something that was going to be low and wide, I'd have a shape that was much lower and wider already. So before I open this up, I'm using my thumbs to pre-drill a little belly button in the top. I'm using my pointer fingers to push that hole down until I just have a little bit of clay left below it. So I can use my needle tool to poke down and take a measurement of how much clay I have in the base. And that's pretty ideal. My goal is to have that thickness match the thickness of my walls when I'm done. So now I'm pulling back to stretch this hole out and make it a little wider. I'm compressing the bottom with my pointer finger just to help make sure that clay is good and strong. This clay loves to crack when you forget to compress it. And now I'm gonna pull the walls. So when I pull the walls, the idea is I'm gonna squeeze and slide my hands up to stretch the clay upwards. And the speed I do this at and the direction that I pull my hands at, all those details are really important because the clay is just gonna follow my hands. And if I lean out when I do this, it's gonna start making a shape like this. If I lean in, it's gonna start leaning same direction. And since my vase is going to be tall and start with a pretty straight shape, I need to be very careful with the way I do this. This is the hardest part when throwing. All right, so I think I'm done pulling. I'm checking by just running my fingers down the walls and I'm checking for areas that might feel a little thicker or thinner than others. I can tell that very bottom corner has just a little bit of thickness. I think I just fixed that. So I think I'm good to proceed to shaping. So before I shape this too much, I have to go ahead and get all the water out of the inside of the pot. I'm starting by using this metal rib to push a little bit of a curve into the vase because I like vase shapes that kind of curve in before they swell out. I think that's looking good. I'm going to flip this around and start pushing the clay out into the curve of this rib tool. And this is scraping some clay off, but that's all right. Clay it's taking off is just that wet and squishy clay on the edge called slip. Next, I'm using my hands to do what's called collaring to squeeze in the top and make it a little bit more narrow. And that's going to be the neck of the vase. Pots have parts named after human bodies. So like on this vase, I'm already done with, this would be the foot. You have the shoulder, you have the waist or the neck, and then the very top is called the lip.
The next step for Audrey is to finish cleaning up her vase. She's shaping it, getting it exactly as she wants to because once she takes her vase off the potter's wheel, she cannot go back and change the look of it. She also looks at the vase from the side to check what she calls the profile of the vase to see how the body is forming. As she mentioned, how it curves in and swells back out. Now she's just cleaning it up a bit before taking it very carefully off of the wheel. All right, so this is a vase that I threw on the potter's wheel last night. I left it out to dry since then. And now this is at a stage that we call leather hard, meaning you can pick it up, you can handle it, manipulate it, it's not squishy. However, it's still soft enough for me to change just a little bit. So I couldn't change the shape anymore, but this is a great time to clean this up and do detail work. Before carving into the vase, Audrey spends some time with a damp sponge, making sure that it's nice and smooth, getting rid of any irregularities. Now let's listen to her inspiration from India. The way that patterns like this start off as actual plants that were being drawn in a really lifelike way. And people with a lot of money were paying really talented artists to go out and document these plants. And then they would hang up the drawings in their homes and their palaces. But this became so fashionable that the ordinary person who didn't have as much money also wanted to decorate their homes in this fashion. And they started hiring artists who were not quite as technically advanced. So what they got was a slightly more cartoony version of an actual plant. And then other artists started copying that style and it started getting even more and more stylized. And then England and other European countries came in and said, ooh, I really like that pattern, but can you make it a little more swirly and purple? And eventually you ended up with patterns like paisley that don't look anything like an actual plant. There's some paisley. But I think it's really interesting the way that some of these actually have roots in very exact nature drawings. With that inspiration in mind, Audrey mentioned that she oftentimes closes that book and sets it aside. She doesn't want to copy patterns. She wants to be inspired by patterns. So knowing that, she closes the book, puts it away, and uses her mind and her imagination to create the beautiful designs on her vases. She's carving and also puncturing into the side of the vase with a variety of tools. Some of them are tools that are a little bit out of the ordinary, like a broken paintbrush does a great job of creating a perfect circle. The back of a paintbrush creates an awesome dot, and she uses special clay tools to carve into her pots. These make for beautiful, unique designs for her works of art. I asked her how could she possibly carve so many pots so quickly? She said it's because she's been carving into pots just like this for a long time. She has what she calls an artistic vocabulary. She knows exactly what she plans to draw before she starts to draw it. That way, drawing comes a lot faster and easier for her. It also means she doesn't have to spend time going back and erasing, which would be pretty difficult to do on the side of a clay pot. Once these pieces are finished, they are going to need to dry out completely before they can be fired in a kiln. Audrey is what's called a production potter. That means, as she said, time is money. She needs to work quickly so that her pots can be produced in mass, meaning when she goes to sell them, she'll have plenty of pots for people to pick and choose from. Once Audrey is finished carving her design on her face, she spends quite a bit of time making sure to remove any little pieces of clay that might be sticking out of her piece. Any small pieces of clay or rough edges, once that piece is fired and glazed in the kiln, can actually become razor sharp and can cause somebody to cut themselves if they were handling the vase. So it's very important that she spend time making sure all of her edges are smooth. She does that with her damp sponge, and a dry brush, just to kind of remove any of those little bits and pieces of clay. When Audrey was working, she chatted a lot about good craftsmanship, meaning to spend a lot of time making a work of art that people will really stop, take notice of, admire, and want to purchase. 
good craftsmanship is vital to an artist who is looking to share their masterpiece with others. And Audrey made sure to spend a good amount of time on her craftsmanship. So my little vase here is now finished. And the next step in the process is firing it. But first it has to dry out completely. If I were to fire this pot that's still a little wet, it would explode in the kiln if I didn't wait for it to dry completely. So I'm gonna put this aside and show you what a piece looks like that has been sitting out a little longer. So this is now completely dried out. This is called greenware and it's bone dry. So that's why it looks a little more white. And even though I can hold this, it's still extremely fragile. If I just barely nicked this on the side of the kiln, it would shatter so easily. So you have to be very careful at this point. But after all the water is dried, I can actually put this in the kiln and fire it. So this is my kiln. It's a Scut brand kiln and it's electric, although there are all different types of kilns. So historically, people fired using wood as their fuel source and um, early kilns were next to uh, the clay source oftentimes. They'd make little pit firings where they'd dig a hole in the ground and put both the pottery and a bunch of wood, catch them on fire, try to get as hot as they can because the temperature you fire to, the hotter it is, the more durable your piece is. But eventually um, people were frustrated because they couldn't get hot enough just in a pit in the ground. So then they started getting a little smarter and they started digging holes into the sides of hills and actually firing inside the earth because that would insulate the fire and let them get it even hotter. So they were building anagama kilns. Eventually people started firing with gas and there's still a lot of potters using gas kilns. Those are great because they heat up very quickly, um, but oftentimes you're manually controlling those. Sometimes they're hooked up to computers, but most of the time these days, electric kilns will be found in pottery studios. First of all, they're a little smaller, more compact. Um, they don't require giant chimneys like wood kilns and they don't require a gas line. And they have these computers that help run the program of the firing. So if I were to just load this up and hit on, the pieces wouldn't survive. You have to instead fire very slowly through different temperature ranges because clay goes through molecular changes as it gets hot and um, eventually it converts to being something that's very durable and stone-like. My clay is called white stoneware, so it actually turns into stone-like material. So you have to be very strategic about how quickly you fire. And sometimes I'll fire fast up to a certain temperature, then I'll slow down, then I'll go a little faster, and the computer controls that for me after I program it. So an electric kiln is basically like a giant toaster oven. It's made of this material called soft brick that's different than the brick on your house because it's designed to insulate. It's not so structural. That's why when you see the outside, there's a metal casing. That's what actually holds it together and makes it strong and durable. But this brick helps hold in the heat, which is important because I'm going to fire this up well over a thousand degrees. For my first firing, I'm going to go up to about 1,800 degrees. So this is what holds the heat in. And then down here, you can see these electric elements and they look pretty similar to what's inside a toaster. Those are what create the heat. They'll end up being glowing red when this gets turned on. And then I also have a computer that controls the speed that those elements fire at. After a piece comes out of the kiln, it is what we call bisqueware, which means it's hard now. I can actually hold this, but it's still not quite as durable as it will be. Um, because the bisque firing is to a lower temperature. But the goal here is to end up with a piece that's very porous and hard enough to be handled for glazing. Um, but we are going to fire this another time to actually make it finalized. It'll be colorful, shiny, it will be strong. You can actually use it with food at that point. So this is just part of the way finished still. And the next step is glazing. So glazes come in all different colors, but the way they work really has more to do with chemistry than it does with the way you would mix paint. Paint has a binder material in it, which is what makes it stick to whatever you paint it on. And glaze doesn't usually have that. Glaze instead is just a bunch of different colored uh, oxides, things like iron, cobalt, copper, lots of things that you'd find on the periodic table. 
Those combine with different glass formers that actually create the glaze. Some are shiny, some are matte, some are translucent, some are opaque. There's all different types of glazes and there are also different glazes designed for different temperature ranges. So you have to be careful when you pick a glaze to make sure it will be a good fit for the clay and for the kiln fire you're using. So I've mixed up my glaze already and I put it in this little squirt bottle. And this is my favorite way to glaze. This is not necessarily how most people glaze. Audrey shared with me that the reason she uses that small tool you're seeing is because it allows her to get inside the small crevices that she initially carved into her pot. She also said that, like many glazes, the color of this one is actually going to change and be a little bit more greenish, which will be perfect for the stems and the leaves. She also uses other colors, as you can see here, on her works of art. Once out of the kiln, the pots are beautifully colored and they've been covered with a coat of clear glaze. Big thanks to Audrey for sharing her amazing process with us from the creation of a vase to allowing it to dry and carve into it and to the beautiful results that her glazing technique share. It has been wonderful to spend time in Audrey's studio. Thank you so very much, Audrey Deal McGever. Well, I really, really hope that you enjoyed taking a look at all of the different pottery studios, uh, the field trip that they had from beginning to end with the kids, uh, as well as a production and a, a woman that runs one out of her home and uh, sells her pottery at events and, so, and such. So I thought those were very detailed and provided a lot of good information on how uh, the pottery actually works in all of the back... Um, back end of what they have to do to get those products to us. So as mentioned in the introduction at the very beginning, um, I just went to my Google search. So actually I'm not on Google right now, I'm on Bing. So I'm gonna go to my Google search. And uh, in my Google search, I am going to just type in Pottery Studio. Now from here I could type in Pottery Studio Field Trips. Um, or studios near me, or virtual field trips. So I'm just going to do field trip ideas. And this is where I got a lot of that information that I shared with you already in the class. This one is called kilncreations.net. Hopefully it loads here. And this is just one kind of studio. This one's actually located in Indiana, uh, in Noblesville, Indiana. It's called Kiln Creations. And they tell you about um, how you can shop, the easy fun that you can have, parties and groups, how uh, you could plan a school field trip, and so forth. So there is a lot of information that they have at their studio. So if you're in the Indiana area, uh, this might be a good one. This is more central Indiana. Uh, I know from the area I'm at, which is closer to the Fort Wayne area, we also have one um, here called Biscuit. And uh, let me see if I can find that. And that is one that I actually frequent uh, and do a lot of pottery with them. So if you haven't uh, had a chance to check their studio out, I would highly, highly encourage it. It's super fun. Now, with these, they're already produced. Uh, created, you would just be printing or painting them, and then they would be putting those in the kiln for you. Uh, now, some of the stuff that we've already witnessed, that would be from beginning to end. So you can go to Pottery Studios and just get the products that are already ready paint and paint them, have them put them in the kiln, and then you can go back and get them later. Uh, so again, this is just one. There's a lot of different ones out there. I found this one's called Brush Fire Pottery Studio, and this one's located in Tennessee. But they have a lot of information here that you could check out. And again, this is all just coming to us from that Google search uh, that we did earlier on uh, pottery. So let me get back. So, uh, la, la, la. 
my computer's being extremely slow today. I apologize. So these are all of the field trip ideas you could do. Uh, you could also just go in and do a uh, Pottery Studio search. And this is going to show the ones closest to you. So if you wanted to take a chance and, and, or wanted to go out and try it out and look at it, that would be uh, a good one as well. Uh, this website here is called the National Gallery of Art. They offer in-school uh, field trips. Uh, everything in here is all about art. So I was going to include this for you. Uh, this may be something that we see later on in our field trips again, uh, but it would be great to go along with the pottery that we've already kind of learned about today. So you can kind of take a look. Um, so I will include this National Gallery of Art into our virtual field trip today as a link. Uh, the rest of these are just part of that Google search. So you could just, this one's called That Pottery Place. This one's located in Nebraska. Same kind of concept. They have a lot of things that you can do there. Uh, but you could just put that search into your search engine and uh, look at one that's coming that is close to you. But in the meantime, I will include this uh, National Gallery of Art. So if it's something that you would like to continue as an art lesson, uh, perhaps you're a homeschooler, or maybe you're just in the educational field altogether, then this would be great for you. I also looked up um, some of these pottery wheels. Now these are geared towards the kids. Uh, we run a robotics program here at the library and I would love nothing more than to implement some of these little pottery wheels into our collection so we're actually able to have some art clay classes. So that is something I'm looking into, but you could come in here and research also uh, the cost of what some of this is. Uh, I was able to get on Amazon and I did search, let me go to my cart, there's one. This is a pottery wheel for kids, but I was able to search and these are some of the searches I came up with and the cost for those. So you would definitely want to check your reviews, uh, see what everybody's doing, find out what your better product is and go from there. So you could have a very simple uh, pottery wheel to do some very simple projects. Obviously a kiln is going to be quite expensive. I don't even know if you can buy one of those on Amazon. Let's see. They have some of the smaller kilns that you could use. But I mean, we're looking at thousands, if not hundreds of dollars for a kiln. But if that's something that you are shopping for, then, and here again, is a sculpting wheel. It doesn't come with those guards or anything, but um, you can most definitely go and take a look at all of your different options for kilns and... See, now this one wouldn't be too bad. It's just a small one. It might hold... Oh, this I think this is just a smoldering pot, so that's not going to work. But you could come in here and look and see what you could find as far as kilns go and what is going to benefit you to have a kiln. Uh, and then here is this that talks about pottery knowledge. So this would be something that you could actually purchase as well and just kind of display it in your classroom or by your um, kiln. So I am actually going to add that to my cart so I don't lose it. But there is a lot you can do. Um, obviously kilns get a little expensive, but if you're just doing it as a hobby, then you may not need to purchase something as large as one of these larger type of kilns. I'm seeing how this works. And this is more of a melter. So you'd want to research a little bit into this before just purchasing what you think you might need. 
All right, guys. Well, that is going to conclude our virtual field trip today. I hope you learned something new as far as pottery and the way that pottery works and the behind the scenes of pottery. Um, I know I did, so I'm excited to perhaps possibly be able to future uh, be able to bring this to us and do our own little um, kilns and yeah, so here, I'm sorry, I'm still <laughs> I'm trying to end, but then I find new things. It's kind of like, so this would be a $700 item. Um, this would be for small projects. And it comes with the various plugs. So your kiln is quite small on this one. Um, but you could research it a little more. So, all right, on that, I'm going to end today. And uh, thank you so much for being a part of our virtual field trip today. Without you, there'd be no reason to have these. So if you have any field trip ideas that you would like to see, please send them my way. My email is listed below for you at the very beginning of the class. You may also uh, visit us on our website to see other virtual field trips coming up through our calendar. So thanks so much, you guys. Have a great day and hope you enjoy that pottery and uh, have fun with it because that's what it's all about. Thanks so much. Have a great one. And I will see you in the next virtual field trip.